Harriet Tubman, well, Harriet Tubman never actually freed the slaves. She just had the slaves go work for other white people. Y'all, we leaving right now. Yo, can someone in this man's life help him? I had this whole one to two minutes scripted out where I was like dunking on Kanye West and just the random nature of disparaging and minimizing an 1800s abolitionist. But with this guy, somehow he is a billionaire anti-vaxxer who holds so much wealth and power and influence, yet when I talk about him, it feels wrong and like I'm punching down because he is so obviously not okay. Anyway, sup you beautiful bastard. I hope you have a fantastic Monday. Welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show. Buckle up, hit that like button and let's just jump into it. And the first thing we're gonna talk about today is the story out of New Jersey where there was a shooting at the home of a federal judge. So this happened last night in North Brunswick at the home of Judge Esther Salas. Reportedly the judge was home at the time of the shooting with reports saying that she was in the basement. She ended up being unharmed, but horribly her 20 year old son Daniel was killed killed and also her husband, a defense lawyer named Mark Andrell, was injured. Now as far as what we know about what happened, we have the Associated Press saying that the alleged gunman was dressed as a FedEx delivery person, though right now it is unclear if that person actually worked for FedEx or was just posing as a delivery person, with reports saying that Daniel opened the door with his father behind him, which is when the suspect shot and then fled the scene. With this news breaking, we also saw the FBI's New York Division tweeting that they were investigating, looking for one subject, also asking the public for any information related to this, also saying that the search was underway. But there was an update this morning when law enforcement sources told NBC News in New York that an attorney found dead in the Catskills may have been the suspect in this case. That man reportedly dying from a self-inflicted gunshot wound. Authorities there are also saying they're still looking into the situation. With NBC also saying they have found a package that was addressed to the judge and are looking into whether or not he was tied to this. We're starting to get more information about who he is as well. Reports calling him a self-described anti-feminist by the name of Roy Den Hollander. He allegedly brought a case before the judge in 2015. Now, all of that said, as far as who Esther Solis is, she was appointed by President Barack Obama in 2010, confirmed confirmed in 2011, making her New Jersey's first Hispanic woman to serve as a U.S. district judge. And since she has had this role, she has had a couple of very high profile cases. She presided over a case involving one of the real housewives in New Jersey, Teresa Judice and her husband Joe, sentencing them both to staggered sentences on fraud charges. She has also reportedly handled cases involving members of the Grape Street Crips, which are in connection to a long running drug trafficking network. In fact, back in 2016, she actually sentenced a leader of the Grape Street Crips to 14 years in prison. Also sentencing a leader of the South Side Cartel, which has been described as one of the most violent gangs in Newark to 45 years years in prison, but most recently, she was assigned last week to a lawsuit filed against Deutsche Bank by numerous investors, with that lawsuit alleging that the bank made materially false and misleading statements regarding the bank's business, operational, and compliance policies, and failed to properly monitor customers that the bank itself deemed to be high risk, including, among others, the convicted sex offender Jeffrey Epstein. And so now, with all of that said, this is why a lot of people, especially this morning, were pointing out past cases for a potential motive. Others now talking about the case the suspect brought forward himself. Though, of note, authorities have still not yet identified a motive and are still looking to see if she may have been the target, if it was directly related to her. You know, according to ABC News, she has received threats in the past with authorities looking into whether or not those threats are tied to this. You also had Francis Mack Womack, the mayor of North Brunswick, who was also good friends with the family, telling ABC, as a judge, she had threats from time to time, but Everyone is saying that recently there had not been any, but ultimately that is where we are with the story as a filming. Of course, one of the biggest things I wanna get across is this is still a developing situation. We'll obviously keep our eyes on it, but for now we have to wait and see. But from that, before we jump into our big deep dive today, also just so everything we talk about today is not completely negative, I wanted to share some stuff I love today and today in awesome brought to you by Keeps. If you didn't know, two out of three guys will experience some form of male pattern baldness by the time that they're 35. But everyone's got that brother, uncle, even that friend. And if you don't wanna go down that road, you don't have to just sit idle by. Keeps helps you stop hair loss before it's too late with their scientific and affordable approach to treatments that are up to 90% effective at reducing and stopping further hair loss. And Keeps offers generic versions of the only two FDA approved hair loss products that are out there. So some of you may have in fact already tried these before, but probably never at these prices. Also, you used to have to go to the doctor's office for your prescription, but with Keeps, you can get your treatment delivered straight to your home. So if you're noticing that you're losing your hair, do something about it. Go to keeps.com slash DeFranco, or just click that link in the description down below to get a special offer on Keeps treatments today. The first bit of awesome today is, if you didn't see, I uploaded a, a brand new video to the uh, youtube.com slash Franco Does channel. This newest one is a fun and infuriating one, and uh, that channel has also been bringing me more joy, so if you're, if you're looking to subscribe to more of my stuff, Blah, there. Then Meet Arnold gave us what if the world's population increased by 10. Then we got the trailer for The Weight of Gold, which looks like a really interesting look at, at the, the mental health issues connected to athletes who go to the Olympics. Entertainment Weekly gave us a Scott Pilgrim versus the World reunion table read. Then, and awesome, if you didn't get a chance to experience The Last Dance, it is now on Netflix. Honestly, even if you're not into to basketball or maybe even a fan of Michael Jordan, I think you might still appreciate it. We had Lenny Kravitz on Tiny Desk Home Concert. Wired gave us a hacker explaining a concept at five different 
different levels of difficulty. And if you wanna see the full versions of everything I just shared, the secret link of the day, really anything at all, links as always are in the description down below. And then let's try to talk about Portland. There's a lot to this story. There's a lot of moving parts. So let's try to break down the situation and hit on some of the key highlights and major points. So. All of this, of course, started back in May, where like in other cities across the country, you had protesters in Portland taking to the streets after the killing of George Floyd. And since then, the protests in Portland have continued for over 50 days now. While many of these protests, especially during the day, have been peaceful, plenty of others have become violent. According to reports, protesters have set fires, engaged in vandalism, thrown objects at police, among other things. Police have also at times responded with force, reportedly clashing with the protesters frequently and sparking claims of police brutality. Last month, local police reportedly fired tear gas at protesters, but the government then signed a law prohibiting them from firing tear gas at protesters unless they declare a riot. The thing with these is while the demonstrations have kept going, they did eventually start to slow down at one point. But then on June 26, we saw President Trump signing an executive order to protect federal monuments, statues, and memorials. And under that, Trump also directed the Department of Homeland Security to create a new task force to enforce this order. And on July 1st, Acting Secretary of Homeland Security, Chad Wolf, issued a statement announcing the creation of PACT, the Protecting American Communities Task Force. And shortly after that, DHS members of the that task force as well as U.S. Marshals were deployed to Portland. And while under Trump's executive order, the agents are simply supposed to protect federal property, they have continually clashed violently with protesters, frequently firing tear gas at protesters, this despite the ruling prohibiting Portland police from doing so in the same instances. The feds have also reportedly been firing munitions at protesters. Last Saturday, Marshals service officers shot a peaceful protester in the face with so-called less than lethal munitions. That also prompting a lot of outrage after photos and videos of that incident circulated online showing the man in the street bleeding from his head. Also, according to reports he was hospitalized with a skull fracture. But the situation really started to gain national attention back on Thursday when Oregon Public Broadcasting, or OPB, began reporting that unidentified federal law enforcement agents in unmarked vehicles had been grabbing protesters off the street since at least July 14th, with OBP saying that both personal accounts and multiple videos posted online show the officers driving up to people, detaining individuals with no explanation of why they are being arrested and driving off, with one now viral video seeming to show two men in camo coming up to a protester on the street, grabbing them and then moving them into a car. And while from the video, it's hard to see if they had any identifying agency on their uniform other than just the word police. We've also now seen people sharing pictures saying that the uniforms and a patch on their arms match those of a picture of Customs and Border Patrol agents in Portland shared by CBP Commissioner Mark Morgan. And that video was also very similar to an account given to reporters by a man named Mark Pettibone. In his account, he told reporters that he and a friend were walking home from a demonstration at around 2 a.m. on a Wednesday when all of a sudden an unmarked minivan pulled up in front of them and several armed people in camouflage and body armor got out with him telling the Washington Post, I was terrified. It was like being preyed upon. And while his friend was able to escape, he was not. With him going on to tell OPB, I am basically tossed into the van and I had my beanie pulled over my face so I couldn't see and they held my hands over my head. Going on to say the agents who never identified themselves drove him to a federal courthouse and placed him in a holding cell. Eventually, two officers went to the cell and read him his Miranda rights. They asked if he would waive his rights and answer some questions. He declines, asks for a lawyer. The officers then responded by ending the interview and releasing Pettibone. And according to his account, they wouldn't tell him why he had been arrested or provide him with any record of his arrest. Also, when talking to the OPB, you know, he said he regularly attended protests, but couldn't think of anything he had done that would make him a target of law enforcement, adding, I just happened to be wearing black on a sidewalk in downtown Portland at the time, and that apparently is grounds for detaining me. Right, so with all that, there had been a ton of backlash from state and local leaders who have called on Trump and Wolf to take the feds out of Portland, many of whom said they never wanted them there in the first place, but Trump sent them anyway. Like Portland Mayor Ted Wheeler, who's also the police commissioner, calling the federal response irresponsible, demanding that the feds stay inside federal buildings or leave the city. Others, like Mike Reese, the sheriff for the county Portland's in also accusing the feds of making the situation worse, calling the federal response a significant setback in the efforts to ease tensions. Those comments were also echoed by Senator Jeff Merkley, who accused the agents of making the situation worse, saying in a tweet on Thursday that the shadowy forces have been escalating, not preventing violence. Oregon Governor Kate Brown also accusing President Trump of deploying the federal officers for his own political gain, writing in a series of tweets on Thursday, this political theater from President Trump has nothing to do with public safety. The president is failing to lead this nation. Now he is deploying federal officers to patrol the streets of Portland and a blatant abuse of power by the federal government, with her also taking aim at Wolf writing, he is on a mission to provoke confrontation for political purposes. He is putting both Oregonians and local law enforcement officers in harm's way. Senator Ron Wyden also making similar comments referring to the feds as Donald Trump's secret police, adding now Trump and Chad Wolf are weaponizing the DHS as their own occupying army to provoke violence on the streets of my hometown because they think it plays well with right-wing media. But on the other side of this, we've seen Wolf and the DHS blaming state and local officials for failing to act in a highly charged press release 
release issued on Thursday, Wolf claimed that it was the local leaders, not the feds, that were making the situation worse. Also defending their presence in the city, arguing that some of the protesters have been destroying a federal courthouse, which is federal property, and saying a federal courthouse is a symbol of justice. To attack it is to attack America, instead of addressing violent criminals in their communities. Local and state leaders are instead focusing on placing blame on law enforcement and requesting fewer officers in their community. This failed response has only emboldened the violent mob as it escalates violence day after day, and adding, this siege can end if state and local officials decide to take appropriate action instead of refusing to enforce the law. DHS will not abdicate its solemn duty to protect federal facilities and those within them. With him also going on to describe the quote, lawless destruction and violence that has happened over the last six weeks in a list where he uses the phrase violent anarchist 72 times. Also very notably on Thursday, Homeland Security Acting Deputy Secretary Ken Cuccinelli confirmed to NPR that yes, Federal agents had used unmarked vehicles to pick up people in Portland, saying they did this to keep officers safe away from crowds and to move detainees to a safe location for questioning. And going on to say, the one instance I'm familiar with, they believed they had identified someone who had assaulted officers or the federal building there, the courthouse. With them also noting that that person ended up being innocent and added, I fully expect that as long as people continue to be violent and to destroy property, that we will attempt to identify those folks. We will pick them up in front of the courthouse. If we spot them elsewhere, we will pick them up elsewhere. And adding, that's standard law enforcement procedure and and it's going to continue as long as the violence continues. Customs and Border Protection also released a statement on Friday confirming that they had detained someone, saying CBP agents had information indicating the person in the video was suspected of assaults against federal agents or destruction of federal property, though notably they did not say what video they were referring to, with them also adding the agents had identified themselves and were wearing CBP insignia at the time. But meanwhile, the U.S. Marshals have not responded to requests for comments from the media. And so while we've seen the Trump administration firmly saying they will ignore the demands of local leaders and keep the feds in Portland, the protests have now grown and evolved in response to these agents staying in their city. According to reports, upwards of 1,000 people showed up to demonstrations this weekend, marking the largest crowds that the city has seen in weeks. Right, and with that, we saw a number of viral moments. For instance, in one situation, we saw a wall of mothers forming a human shield between the protesters and law enforcement officials. They then stood their ground for a few hours until the feds began using tear gas and flashbangs to break up the crowd. In another notable moment, we saw a Navy vet, Chris David, calling out a group of federal officers. This reportedly after they rushed a line of protesters, knocking them to the ground. David then walks up up and says, why are you not honoring your oath? Why are you not honoring your oath to the Constitution? They then beat him with a baton, sprayed chemical irritants in his face. We later learned that because of this interaction, his right hand had been broken in two spots. Now, uh, along with these instances, we also have some instances of protesters becoming violent. For example, on Saturday, Portland police declared a riot after the police union building was broken into and lit on fire. We also saw protesters tearing down fencing around the federal courthouse, federal police responding with tear gas. Local police then announcing it had arrested four people for charges related to rioting and interfering interfering with a police officer. Now, leading into the weekend on Friday, we saw the Oregon Department of Justice announce that the state attorney general, Ellen Rosenblum, would soon be filing a lawsuit. This in response to the accusations that people were being taken off of the streets and put into vans by unmarked police officers. The Oregon DOJ saying that federal authorities overstepped their powers and injured or threatened peaceful protesters on the streets of downtown Portland. Later that same day, we also saw Rosenblum filing that lawsuit against a number of agencies, including DHS, Customs and Border Protection, the U.S. Marshal Service, and the Federal Protection Service. That lawsuit also listing 10 unknown individuals known as John Doe's one through 10 as defendants and regarding them, Rosenblum says, on information and belief, John Doe's one to 10 are employed by the United States government in a law enforcement capacity. They have made it impossible for them to be individually identified by carrying out law enforcement actions without wearing any identifying information, even so much as the agency that employs them. Right, but overall, what we saw with this lawsuit was the accusation that these agencies are engaging in unlawful law enforcement tactics. Noting federal law enforcement officers, including John Doe's one to 10, have been using unmarked vehicles to drive around downtown Portland, detain protesters and place them into the officer's unmarked vehicles, removing them from public without either arresting them or stating the basis for an arrest since at least Tuesday, July 14th. The lawsuit itself also directly mentions Pettibone and his testimony. It then goes on to state that it is not just him, adding that other citizens in Portland have been detained, quote, without warning or explanation, without a warrant, and without providing any way to determine who is directing this action. And going on to claim that these agencies are injuring citizens by taking away their ability to determine whether or not they're being kidnapped or arrested. And they're noting that if you're being kidnapped, you of course would be able to engage in self-defense. However, if you're being arrested, that could amount to resisting arrest, but right, to be clear, you wouldn't know. And so that's why with this lawsuit, you have them asking for federal agents to be required to identify themselves and their agency before making an arrest. And also for them to be required to give an explanation as to why they're detaining someone for an arrest. Now, in addition to this lawsuit, you have the Oregon DOJ also seeking a temporary restraining order to prevent federal authorities from unlawfully detaining people in the state. Notably, it's not just Oregon's DOJ. On Friday, we saw the American 
American Civil Liberties Union Foundation of Oregon filing a lawsuit against DHS and the United States Marshals Service. This in an attempt to block federal law enforcement from dispersing, arresting, threatening to arrest, or using physical force against journalists and legal observers. With Kelly Simon, the interim legal director of Oregon's ACLU saying, this is a fight to save our democracy. Under the direction of the Trump administration, federal agents are terrorizing the community, risking lives, and brutally attacking protesters demonstrating against police brutality. These federal agents must be stopped and removed from our city. Now, with these lawsuits, there have also been a lot of questions about how much authority agencies like the DHS have. Also, what kind of authority do they have? And to look at that, we have to look back to why the DHS was created. Right, and if you're unaware, it was formed after 9-11. And its job was mainly to handle national security threats from abroad, as well as border security. And now, ever since Trump took office, it's largely carried out his immigration policies. However, with Portland, its presence has been more focused on law and order. For example, some of the agents deployed in Portland are part of a group known as BORTAC, right, which is basically Border Patrol's equivalent of a SWAT team. And very notably, it is a highly trained group that is normally tasked with things like investigating drug smuggling organizations as opposed to protesters in cities. So situations like that have now raised questions about whether it is overstepping local law enforcement. I mean, you even have Portland's deputy police chief saying, I don't have authority to order federal officers to do things. It does complicate things for us. However, on the other side of this, you have Trump arguing that Portland police have failed to adequately respond to the protests. But of note there, according to an internal DHS memo dated from Thursday and obtained by the New York Times, those federal officers have also not been trained in riot control or mass demonstrations. But still, despite that, yesterday we saw a DHS spokesperson saying that the missions of the federal agents were, quote, aligned with their appropriate training and claiming that the officers received additional training for their deployment in the city to assist the Federal Protective Service. But also, to go back to that memo, regarding if we could see this kind of response in other cities, it states, moving forward, if this type of response is going to be the norm, specialized training and standardized equipment should be deployed to responding agencies. And as of this morning, we're seeing reports that something like that might be able to happen happen very soon. This coming alongside reports that claim DHS is crafting plans to deploy about 150 federal agents in Chicago this week. We've also seen Trump indicating he would like to increase federal presence in U.S. cities, which, depending on what happens in Chicago, he might already be doing. Also this morning, we saw Republican Senator Rand Paul denouncing the Trump administration's use of federal agents in Portland. There, Paul tweeting, we cannot give up liberty for security. Local law enforcement can and should be handling these situations in our cities, but there is no place for federal troops or unidentified federal agents rounding people up at will. But ultimately, that is where we are with this story right now. Obviously, we're gonna have our eyes on this. And you know, with this, I do wanna pass the question off to you. What are your thoughts on all this? And that is where I'm going to end today's show. I appreciate you liking the video, sharing it, being a part of the conversation in the comments down below. Also, if you're new here, you want more of these daily dives into the news, hit that subscribe button, definitely tap that bell so it looks like this. Also, if you're looking for more to watch, if you wanna watch my newest bonus video, or maybe just miss the last Philip DeFranco show you wanna catch up, you can click or tap right there to watch either of those. But with that said, of course, as always, my name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love yo faces. And I'll see you tomorrow. I hope you like the video. Subscribe if you like it.